So episodic memory is exactly what we're talking about. It is remembering an episode of your life. So if I asked each of you, what did you have for dinner last night? How many could remember that? Okay. All right. Now you're remembering an episode of your life. Those of you who are going, yeah, not so much. It's because something in there did not stick for you. So the episodes are stories or experiences in our life that left an impact or is in short proximity. So if I asked each of you, for example, how many of you remember your second grade teacher? All right, give me a name. Ms. Okay, who? Ms. Mrs. Pointer. Mr. K, that's all I remember. <laughs> okay, so those of you who don't remember second, do you remember third? I remember the faces, but I can't remember the names. Okay. Typically what will happen when we have an episodic memory, it's because something has triggered that. So if I asked you, why, what do you remember about that teacher? Because you gave me a name. What do you remember? I remember how nice she was. Okay. 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 And yours? Um, I remember she directed the talent show. Okay. There's snacks. Ice water is on its way. Woo! Woo Excellent. Well done. Oh. oh, now we're talking, right? That first hour we were withering, but now we're talking. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Okay. When the announcement came over the PA and this kind of thing. Right, so right. Really kind of connected in a sideways way, right? Right. Uh, but there's a reason for that, and we're going to talk about that's very important. Okay. So usually what I'll hear when somebody talks about remembering their second grade teacher or their third grade teacher, it's because it left an emotional impact. So they were nice, which probably made me feel good when I was scared, or I remember them being creative as part of a talent show, or I've had people say, I remember Mrs. Jones because she used to tell me I was stupid all the time, you know, left a negative impact. So usually what happens when we have an episodic memory, I mean, think about the brain. Tons of information is coming in, even as I'm talking to you right now. You have to decide, what am I going to remember? What's important? What should I get rid of? Because the brain can't, has to filter. When a neuron pathway is laid down, it's because I remember this, this was the feeling that it conjures, and so it becomes a more integrated memory because the neurons are now connected. I use the story of um, for a, a memory to be laid down, you need a couple of elements. One, and I'll use this as mine, when I smell baking bread, I immediately have a visual of my grandmother, and I immediately have a warm, wonderful feeling. So those three neurons are connected, the smell of bread, her, her face, her voice, her vision, and how I felt, which was positive. So that little triangle, those three neurons are tied together and they are mine. They are unique to my brain. Now unfortunately, I worked with a woman several years ago who was raped near a bakery. So of course the smell of bread conjures up fear and panic and a terrible image. That triangle of images, all with just the same trigger of smelling the bread, is her memory bank. Those neurons are tied together, smelling bread and fear, which normally we would go, why, that doesn't make sense to the brain. It makes sense to her memory. So it's, it's an example of how neurons can lay down their own unique pathway and that's why when we go to remember something, if it's nondescript and it didn't really have an impact on us one way or another, hence the two of you who don't remember your second grade teacher, it was probably nondescript. Not bad, but not great, but it could have been a different teacher or a different time that left more of an impact. That's our episodic memory, okay? 
Then we have another memory system called the semantic memory. This also sits in the temporal lobe, but more to the front por portion of the brain. The semantic memory is a memory of just kind of knowing. So if I asked you, for example, what is the color of the sky? What would you tell me? Blue. Okay. How do you know it's blue? Okay. Okay. But think about what has to happen for that. Your visual cortex has to look at a color. And then the language center of the brain has to be stimulated to say, oh, that color is blue. So the visual cortex has an image, the cognitive cortex says, and the color is blue. Now, if when you were in grade school and somebody said to you, that my shirt right here is green, you would always, your visual cortex would look at that color and go, that's green. That's what you learn. That's how you understand that. Now, this gets to executive functioning and more complex reasoning. So if I'm teaching you the color of blue and I say, that shirt is blue, you're going to visually look at that shirt, you're going to come up with the word blue. Now, if we look at your, your pack there and we say, what color is that? Now, to a child with a brain that is not capable yet of executive functioning, they might say, I don't know, because it doesn't look like that, right? We learn as we go along to extrapolate. I'm sorry, I advanced that. To extrapolate and go, well, there's various shades of blue. I kind of know what blue looks like. I've learned it. That is our semantic memory. The other things that we would ask somebody to assess their semantic memory would be things like, tell me in what way red and blue are the same. What would you say? They're both colors. What about table and chair? How are they the same? Furniture. They're both furniture. Button and snap. Way to close something. Okay. You see how they become a little more complex? And actually on an IQ test, we start with that. that th those questions are actually from an IQ test. So people who are really able to function at a basic level without disease, everybody should be able to get that red and blue are colors. When somebody starts to lose their semantic memory, they're going to say to you, well, they're not the same. Or if they haven't had higher education and they're thinking at a very basic level. But most people should be able to extrapolate and go, well, yes, I know they're different, but there is something they have in common. And that's our semantic ability to reason, OK? The next area of the brain is something called the procedural memory. And this one sits right back here in the basal ganglia of the cerebellum. In way of orienting about the brain, the back area of the brain is responsible for your balance, for sequencing of information that has to do with motor skills, okay? So when you think about it, if this disease called Alzheimer's starts here in the hippocampus and it spreads back here before it spreads anywhere else, you're going to find a person who tends to have more difficulty with balance, with coordination. Maybe they're more of a fall risk. They might be acting pretty appropriate because maybe right now that frontal lobe hasn't been particularly damaged. So they're not publicly masturbating, yelling out, striking people. They're just continually falling and maybe not able to figure out the sequence of things. So I use this as an example by saying, Somebody in here, describe for me how to drive a stick shift car. Who knows how to drive a manual vehicle? Nobody here has ever, okay. I want you to, to walk me through the steps of how to drive a manual vehicle. Yep, yep, that, that gear thingy, gotcha. We're all with you, right? Right, no, it's okay. Uh, okay, wait, so we have to go back. See, I did that wrong, didn't I? Okay, all of you. This is a, this is a, a case. That's right, exactly. Uh, yeah, right. Hmm, okay, all right. Well, all right, well, you would put the clutch in first. Then I put the gear shift in first. And then I 
slowly release and then accelerate. Mm -hmm. And then as I get to a certain speed, I have to push the clutch in again and pull the, the gear to gear. <laughs> right. And let's say if, like, as you're trying to do that, right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So now hang on to that because I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back to that. Now, somebody describe for me how to take a shower. How do you take a shower? Okay. Okay. Now you and I both know that there's a lot more steps in taking a shower. I'm not going to ask you the details of like which piece of clothing do you take out first. Do you run the water? Do you put your hand underneath to test the temperature when you step in? The point being, there are so many things that we do so automatic that we don't think about it. I mean, I would lay money down that none of you this morning as you took your shower or last night said, okay. Now I need to take off my pants, pull my shirt off, turn the water on, stick my hand under, check the temperature. Your brain is nine million miles away doing a whole bunch of things because taking a shower is overlearned. Your brain has a memory for that. Your brain knows how to, to do that. So it goes into automatic pilot while the other parts of your brain are chitter chattering, doing something else. You're not staying there going, I'm not really sure what to do next because you know what to do next. If you haven't driven a stick shift car in a while, you see the struggle. Now, if she drove here in, in a, a manual vehicle, that would not have been the answer. Should have been able to say, here's exactly what happens because I do it every day. I don't even think about it. The things that we haven't performed in a while requires us to go back in time and think about the steps. But we know steps are important because if you're trying to drive without changing the, the um, thing of above, <laughs> that thingy, you're not putting it into first and second, you're not going anywhere. Or if you're trying to do that first before you turn the car on. And so again, the point is for our procedural memory, our brain has to know how to go from step one to step two to step three. It can't go step one to step four because most tests don't, don't allow us to do that. I point this out because this is a perfect example when we're dealing with somebody with memory loss and we will say, all right, Mrs. Jones, here's the washcloth with, you know, you put some soap on it and you wash your private parts and I'll help you with your back. And Mrs. Jones is standing there with her washcloth. And if we're not trained in this, we're thinking, well, she's pretty stubborn. She doesn't want to do this. And so then we think if we say it again or we say it louder, she's going to get, Mrs. Jones, you need to wash your bottom and I'm going to rinse your hair. Now take the rag and wash. Put some soap on it. Again, the point being, we continue to make assumptions that somebody has that area of the brain functioning. But if you lose the ability to go from step one to step two, much like you were struggling with your car, if somebody's saying, come on, drive over here, what, what's taking you so long? It's because you can't remember the steps. So it's an important thing to understand and to think about when you're dealing with somebody with memory loss and I often use the analogy that if we could only just look right past the person and right into their brain and go, oh, I see it. I see the damage back there in that pink area. You're not going to be able to do this. Or as they're doing something really inappropriate, we go, oh, I get it. That blue area of your brain, that's almost completely destroyed. Then my expectation of you is different. The sad reality is we're looking at somebody, they look fine. So we make assumptions from our own self that they must be fine. And the reality, again, being, and why I map this out in detail and spend a lot of time on looking at the functioning of the brain, is when we're dealing with somebody with memory loss and disease, we really have to think about it. If I just peeled that skull off and I was looking, based on what you're doing and what you're struggling with, could I figure out where that damage is? Because I think it allows a different level of sensitivity when we're taking care of somebody. All right, and finally, we have our working memory. This sits right here in the prefrontal cortex, front and center of the brain. Now this is where if I said to each of you, I am going to give you information and I want you to remember it. And the information is this, I'm going to give you my cell phone number. 
It is 216-555-7842. Now we're going to go on and we're going to talk. And when I come back at the end of it, I might ask you for my number. And there's a very good chance that most of you aren't going to remember it, right? And why? Because the prefrontal part of the memory is kind of that filter, the filing system. You're sitting there thinking, OK, blah, blah, I'm hungry. These are, the pretzels are going to hold me over, but I wonder how long she's going to go. OK, she just gave me her cell phone number, but unless it's the pizza delivery guy, I'm not really caring much, right? And I'm also thinking the last four digits should be simple. Right. So Right. But we're going to forget it. Right, you will, because it doesn't have any meaning. Yes. Now if I said to you, I want you to remember my cell phone, and in one month I'm going to come back. And those of you who remember my cell phone, I'm going to give you a thousand dollars. How many of you are going to remember my cell phone? <laughs> yeah. And what are you going to do to try to remember it? You're going to write it down. Okay, so you're going to do some kind of a repetitive task to, to hang on to it. Yep. Okay. I'm going to say your name and write it down right beside. <laughs> right, okay. Now if I said to you, if after one year you still remember my cell phone number, I'm going to give you $10,000. How many of you are going to remember my phone number after a year? Okay. And why is that? Because now we have said to the prefrontal cortex, this is important stuff because we're motivated. We're going we're gonna to go through a whole process of taking it from this area of the brain where it first came in because I just said it to you. And over time through those tasks that you're going to do, re repeating it, coming up with a mantra, putting it on your mirror every day, saying it to yourself, looking at the calendar going, OK, that crazy lady is going to be back here in another week. I got to remember that. Whatever you're doing, you're going to take that information and you're going to migrate it from that prefrontal lobe. You're going to move it right back in here in the short-term memory. Sometimes that process to have it ingrained in here and stored where it doesn't slip away takes time and ongoing repetition. But once it's there, it's there. So if after I come back in a year, you've still gone through your repetition, what you're going to do then is you're going to move that from the short-term memory bank. And if I had a 3D image of the brain, you're going to move that deep inside the cortex, so deep into the brain, which is where our long-term memory sits. So the, there's a very good chance that if after one year you're motivated, you take your $10,000 and off you go. If I came back even five years with no a motivation for you, no money, no carrot dangling, there's a very good chance that you're going to still remember that. It's like the song that gets stuck in your head, right? Because you've said to yourself, this is important, this is important, this is important. You've trained the brain, you've laid the tracks, you've moved the information in, you've embedded it now in that deep area of the brain. That is how our working memory works. Things that we don't need to hang on to, we get rid of very quickly because why clutter the brain with that? I use the analogy that for those of you who are old enough to remember this thing called the yellow pages. So if you wanted a pizza, what did you have to do? You would open this yellow page book. Pages were actually yellow for those of you who are young. You'd turn the page under pizza. You'd see the pizza phone number. And what would you do? You'd say it to yourself. 375-4897, 375-4897. You'd repeat it just long enough that you could close the yellow book, pick up your phone and go one ringy dingy, two ringy dingy, right? You dial that phone number. Now the pizza guy says, what do you need? You give your order. You don't need to remember the phone number because you got what you wanted, right? right? That is, again, how the working memory works. Give it to me quick in seconds and let me get rid of it. That, that which is important, I'm going to hang on to. All right, now I want to do a quick zip through. Somebody give me a time here so I can keep oriented. OK. OK, good. I'm going to zip through the assessment process fairly quickly. Now, I know for most of you, you're not actually doing the assessments. People are usually coming to you already with a diagnosis. But I always feel like it's helpful to kind of have the backstory of how did we get there. So very quickly, we're going to first start with the screening out. Remember I said at the beginning of this talk, sometimes our seniors, we say, well, they're 80 and they're forgetful, it equals dementia. But guess what? Maybe not. 
So when somebody comes in, the first thing we want to do is get some neuroimaging, an MRI, a CAT scan. We want to make sure there isn't something going on that we can treat or we need to be aware of. What if somebody has a tumor? What if somebody has a bleed? What, what if somebody's just recently had a stroke that we're unaware of? We definitely want to start with a screening of some kind of neuroimaging study. Then we're going to look metabolically. Remember when I talked about that before? So things like somebody's thyroid, folic acid, B vitamins. We want to understand their alcohol consumption because people who are chronic alcohol drinkers, they don't absorb an important vitamin called thiamine. If somebody is thiamine deficient, because no matter how much they're eating, if you have chronic alcoholism, the body won't absorb that you develop a condition called Wernicke's encephalopathy. And if we don't get the person to quit drinking and we don't supplement them with thiamine, it will go on to become Korsakoff dementia, which is permanent damage. So part of our workup is to ask those important questions to understand what other insults might be going on with the brain. There's also something called RPR that we do as part of our dementia workup. What that really is looking at is something called latent syphilis. So some of our older residents um, or our older patients who were around, particularly during World War II, were probably, for many, I won't say all, but exposed to the syphilis virus. And it can sit dormant in the brain and then become active in later years. So we're looking for latent syphilis, which can also look like a dementia picture. For me, I'm also looking at something that, um, anything that is treatable and reversible. So somebody who has the vitamin deficiencies, the electrolyte deficiencies, maybe an active infection, that needs to be treated. If we address those uh, acute issues, sometimes the symptoms completely go away. And whether you're 80 or you're 90, that doesn't equal that you would automatically have to have a diagnosis of dementia. Then as part of the workup, we're also looking for genetics. Even though we know there isn't a one-to-one -one correlation like there is with Huntington's disease, I mean, if somebody comes in and they say, my father had Huntington's, my brother has Huntington's, the, the biological risk factor is very high that you yourself would have that. If somebody comes in with certain biomarkers for uh, breast cancer, we know that there is now identifiable biomarkers. If your mom has this, your sister has this, you need to be really aggressive about taking good care of your breast health. Alzheimer's is not one of those. The correlation is not a one-to-one -one like it is for these other conditions, but it just raises enough of a flag to say, hmm, we do see that the disease can run in families. Why? What are some of the other environmental or other risk factors that maybe we're overlooking? But it causes us to pause so we do pay attention to the genetics. Now I want you to tell me what that first image was that you just saw on the slide. Apparently, I need to give you guys more to eat. <laughs> All right, now give me the sequence. The star, the star smile. smiley face, two smiley and face, then a smiley face separated, and then a smiley face. Okay. What was the color of the star? Blue. blue. What was the color of the smiley face? Blue. White and blue. Blue. And the last one? Okay, so how'd you do? Most everybody got that the star was blue, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Many of you said this face was clear. The face was actually blue. The last one was the clear face, clear face with the blue face inside the clear face. Now, why do I show this? Well, first of all, one of the things that we know about the brain is the brain likes simple. Just like most things, the brain wants it to be easy. A blue star, pretty easy to remember, right? The brain sees it, even if, as I'm quickly flashing it, it's easy to record, pretty easy to remember because it's a very simple image. Now I do this to you, and while a smiley face is not such a hard thing to remember, at a quick glance, to go back and remember, it's not a blue face? That kind of doesn't gel, right? So it's a little more complex. It requires the brain to go, huh? Okay, now i got to remember a color. They don't really go together. And then lastly, we've got a pretty complex image, right? You don't walk around every day and think about a face inside of a face and which color. And this requires much more energy from the brain to go, all right, I got to remember that. It's a face. I could have even asked you which eye had the face in it. 
because to ask you to recreate this is much more complex. So again, the point being, when we give somebody tests and, and tasks to perform when we're testing them cognitively, we expect that people should be able to get things that are simple tasks, easy, familiar. It's the novel things that create more difficulty that raises the level of complexity that the brain has to function at. All right, now out loud, I want all of you to do this. Name as many animals as you can. Go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are good. <laughs> That's a good question for you. All right, now I want you to do the same thing and name as many things as you can that start with the letter H. Okay, so which was easier? Animals. Why? Because you can see it right away, maybe. Okay. You're thinking more on letters as opposed to the visual of animals. Okay. You're right on all of those, but the reality is also when I asked you to remember the, the names, to, to give me names of animals. I structured this for you. I put you in a box. I gave you a category. You couldn't give me anything but animals, right? It's a pretty structured question. When I asked you to give me the names of things that start with the letter H, it was pretty unstructured. I didn't care what you gave me. It could have been an emotion, could have been an animal, could have been a color, could have been a place. So things that are unstructured, even with a healthy brain, is harder tasks to do. Now imagine if you already have a compromised brain. This is exactly why when we say to people in a memory care unit, our residents require structure. Make it simple. Too many complex questions, too many complex choices. We're getting into that same thing about the letter H. So for sometimes we come at this from our own sense again, like the meal time. We might want to say, Mrs. Smith, would you like a hamburger or a hot dog? Would you like me to put that on a bun? Would you like ketchup or mustard? Do you want me to cut that for you? Would you like tea in your coffee or, or cream in your coffee? What seems like a nice, appropriate, I'm giving a person choices. You know, we want to value their autonomy. If I am Mrs. Smith and I'm in an intensive care unit, I want choices. I want you to value by saying to me, what can I do for you? Do you want a hamburger or a hot dog as opposed to going, no, she's getting a hot dog. But the same thing does not apply. What we think is being kind and gracious and, and giving somebody autonomy actually can create more confusion. If the brain is saying, please, structure for me, I can't, I can't do that task. So what do we do on memory care units? We will oftentimes plate the food so the person only has to visually point. You don't even need to use language skills. Or we're going to structure it in a way that our questions are very simple. We're not piggybacking because, you know, we're great creatures of piggybacking questions, right? Do you want something to drink? Do you want me to get you this? Do you want, you know, before a person can even respond, we're already piggybacking our questions. So it's really important when you're working with memory care that you are structuring, structuring, structuring their environment, your questions, their choices, to make it simple. Not to remove their dignity or take away autonomy, but to help the brain preserve its ability to function. Okay? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this now, but again, certainly we do a lot of cognitive testing. We're looking at level of awareness, consciousness, attention and concentration, language skills visual, spatial, because each area of the brain is responsible for these different tasks. Now I'm putting this up here because when I'm doing an assessment, one of the, the simplest tools that I use on a regular basis, even probably more than I use the mini mental status exam that we talked about, is the clock drawing. How many of you are familiar with the clock drawing? Okay, why do we do that? What's that all about? Why do we make somebody draw a clock?
okay? So think about this task because it's, a, it's actually a, if you ask the questions exactly the way that you're supposed to, it's a pretty valid test. Now, if you vary it, you know, you lose some of your validity of the test, but the test asks this, I want you to draw for me the face of a clock. Put the numbers on as they would appear and make the clock read 10 minutes after 11. Now, in order to be successful, four different areas of the brain have to be functional for this. So for me, this is a very quick snapshot into where is the dysfunction. Because in order, first of all, to draw the clock and orient the numbers, you have to be able to have visual spatial skills, right? Because most people who have deficit are going to start with the number 12. Many people will begin to know that that's what they need to do. And then it might be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. They're going to get all the way down, and then it's all one side of the clock and can't figure out something's not right, but the numbers they can't orient. They can't do the 12, 6, 3, and 9 and then fill in the, the, the gaps. So that's one skill set. The second is they have to be able to put hands on. Now, to put the hands on a clock, you have to remember, and that's a different area of the brain, the visual memory of where is the big hand and the little hand. You have to know that the hands are of different size, because if the clock's going to read accurately, you can't have two big hands and two little hands, right? And then finally, when I said to them, make it read 10 minutes after 11, that's part of that semantic memory, right? It's just knowing. Because the reality is, if you were from a different planet and you looked at this and thought, well, why would the big hand be on the number two for 10 minutes after? Like, that has nothing to do with it. When you lose your semantic memory, residents or patients want to go towards the number 10, right? Because you said 10 minutes after 11. It's what we call perseveration in the thinking. Because in order to tell time, you have to know that time goes 5, 10, 15, 20, right? So you can see how this test alone gives you a sense of how those different areas of the brain are functioning. So if you look at this clock, for example, what do you see there? It's right, correct? I mean, that's the right one. We look at this one, what are you noticing about that clock? There's, it looks like they were trying to put three hands on it. Okay. Or maybe they were getting it wrong and they were. Right. So they're trying to figure out, like, why would, I, where does this hand go? Like, okay, this is the 12. They're trying to orient themselves. So you have three hands, but you also see how there's spindles. Yeah. They couldn't do the visual spatial from memory. It was, they were getting closer. They knew there had to be a grid, like these two have to go across, but the only way for them to do that was to actually mark the clock. What do you notice about, let's say this one here? Okay, this person is post-stroke. So their visual field is reversed. So instead of the clock going this way, they're seeing everything in their visual field opposite. And what about this one? I'm missing the 12, and they crossed out what they thought they had in or something, maybe. Mm -hmm. And if you notice here, this is exactly what I was talking about. It's supposed to read 10 minutes after 11. But the first thing that the person did was go to the number 10, because you said 10 minutes after. And then it was only with trying to struggle their way through it that it became, wait a minute, no, that's not right. But it's a very painful process to watch somebody try to do this when they have deficits. But that's one of the reasons that I find it to be a very quick, fast, easy tool for us to be able to, to utilize. If I have somebody who has a very high IQ prior to this disease and a lot of higher education, they can usually fake their way through the mental status exam and get an artificially high score. But nobody can fake their way through the clock. Okay, I'm gonna pass on all of that. Other than on this slide here, I'm just gonna make a quick note that early on in the process, it's important for us to do a good assessment of where depression sits because depression can mirror a lot of signs and symptoms that are very similar to uh, dementia. So we have to tease those apart early on in the process. And I often will say, of everything that is different, this word here is the one thing that I always look for. It's called anhedonia. And what anhedonia means is loss in pleasure in previously enjoyed activities. 
So this isn't somebody who says, you know, I, I lost interest in playing golf because I had a stroke and I can't swing. This is the person who says, it used to be that when my grandchildren came to visit, I could feel my spirits pick up, even for that little bit of time. And now they come and I, I, like I love them and I'm happy to see them, but I don't feel it. So that's really a sign and symptom of anhedonia that is really a hallmark of depression and not really related to the dementia.